And so uh, we're making great progress here. We are reaching the end of the Old Testament here. Okay, so Malachi and exile. Amen. So, guys, last book of the Old Testament. Or is it? Okay, Malachi, Malachi. Let's talk about a little bit of context here. Malachi comes from the Hebrew word meaning messenger, which points to Malachi's role as a prophet of the Lord. Okay, a little bit of your language, fundies. Malachi, Malachi. Uh, Malach is also angel, the word used for angel. And Melech is the word used for king. Same root derivative, okay? Messenger, angel, and king, all appointed, designated to be messengers of God. Okay, that's Hebrew root word. Okay, so there's nothing else that we know about Malachi. Uh, there aren't any other typical markers such as his father's name or the current leader of Israel to give us any further information. But based on the content of the book, it becomes clear that he delivered his message of judgment to a Judean audience familiar with worshipping at the temple. We know that from Malachi 2 verse 11. Now, the people of Judah had also turned away from true worship, leaving themselves under judgment and in need of salvation. So, he wrote to the people of Judah in a time period between 538 and 333 BC. That's just a nice way of saying we don't actually know, because that's what a 200-year period <laughs> that we're looking at here, okay? But we do know that it was when the Persian Empire ruled the promised land and so he challenged the corruption of the temple sacrifices and Malachi's concerns mirror those of ne Nehemiah's okay which some suggest that he prophesied to the people while Nehemiah left the city for several years beginning in 432 BC and so that's just a, a thought of some scholars okay so if you look at the literary context, again, we're not going to get into it, but um, uh, you can see three major themes coming through here, love, rebuke, and hope. You know, when Malachi challenged, who did he challenge? He challenged the priests for their irreverence, their disobedience, their cynicism, and their hypocrisy, okay? And then he also challenged the people with their intermarriage with the pagans, the indifference or spiritual apathy, robbing God. We're all familiar with that passage out of Malachi chapter 3, okay, talking about tithing, okay. And, and so that's just a snapshot look at the book of Malachi and in terms of the message that he delivered. Okay, so why is Malachi so important? So at the time of Malachi, think about his timing. Over a thousand years after Abraham's era, the Israelites had the advantage of history on their side. They could see the rewards of faithfulness and punishments associated with judgment, even to the point of being uprooted from their land. They had history on their side, okay? There's a famous philosopher, Hegel or Hechel, depending on how you want to pronounce it. One thing that history has taught people is that people don't learn from history. Okay, and so that is, you ask, what, what is the relevance of history? It's because we're able to look back on characters, times, and events and say, what's the good that we can extract from that and what's the bad? Israel had a thousand years worth of history concerning their covenant relationship with God that they could look back on and learn from. But even then, the book teaches us that they still strayed from him. Isn't that sinful nature? It's human nature, man, you know. Israel still needed God's intervention as much as ever, even though centuries had passed. And so this book is a final statement of judgment in the Old Testament, anticipating what? God's saving work through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what you see through the prophets you know, is this, this forward, looking forward to hope and renewal and rebirth through a promised Messiah and his kingdom. So, what's the big idea? By the time of Malachi, the people of Judah had been back in the land for more than a hundred years. 
and were looking for the blessings that they expected to receive after they'd returned. Remember how we talked about this renewed hope, this excitement, this energy? But now a century has gone past, a hundred years, and where is it? The temple had been rebuilt, but the fervor of those early days gave way to what? A spiritual apathy, kind of like a, an indifference, okay? And what did that lead to? Corruption and a spiritual lethargy amongst the people. So this is a century on. You guys get that? A century on from the, the temple having been rebuilt. And now this is the Rubable's temple. Remember that, huh? Okay. Malachi came along at a time when the people needed to believe that God still loved them. See, the people had focused on their unfortunate circumstances and had refused to account for their own sinful deeds. And so what did God do? He pointed the finger back at them. And through Malachi, God told the people where they'd fallen short in their covenant relationship with Him. It was kind of a situation of, God, why have you done this? Where's our promised blessings? And where's our hope? And God says, well, where have you been? This is a two-way street, this relationship that we have. It's not just all on me, it's all on you. And if they hoped to see changes, they needed to take responsibility for their own actions, okay? And serve God faithfully according to the promises. Okay, so, here's some 3C, 3D thoughts around practical theology. God's final word of the Old Testament concerns judgment for sin. And it testifies to our inability to love Him without the help of His grace. Okay, so let's, let's break that down. Do any of you struggle to follow God consistently? <laughs> we all do, okay? It would only take an infallible God, sorry, an infallible person to follow an infallible God completely. Does that make sense? A perfect person the perfect God would never fail, all right? But Malachi's call prompts us to live faithfully before God and offers hope that God is not yet through with us. Though we fall short, though we mess up, what is Malachi saying? God's continuously extending His grace and His love for us to return to Him and be obedient to Him. And so how we need to think about Malachi in the context of our own discipleship is, you know, we are weak, imperfect, but in light, in light of God's grace, it produces consistency in us. That, that it's that spirit, that heart of man, I can do this. Yeah, I might have messed up yesterday or even this morning, but this afternoon, I can be consistent in my faithfulness. Why? Because God is consistent in his love for me. It's not dependent on me, okay? And it's, it's, it's growing in our appreciation for that love, for that grace that God pulls us out, not to give an excuse for sin, but to produce the consistent faithfulness that God desires of us as His covenant people. Does that make sense? God's grace fuels us in our imperfection to live more faithfully consistent lives. Amen. So, if we pull Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi together, these three post-exilic prophets were primarily concerned with three things. Status of the temple, new religious hierarchy, and the religious obligations of the community. Those are three recurring themes. themes. This is what these guys were concerned most about. Temple, who was in charge and how they were conducting themselves, as well as the community and how they interacted with one another. So, remember how we started out with Daniel, talking about the way of the exile, okay? We're going to pull that theme right through here and close this section uh, watching a video on exile. There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. 
Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story, how they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Uh, They didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the promised land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now, eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, it wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more, no matter where you live. Yeah, I I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Now Israel's scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. Yeah, Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed in the stranger. He said God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus also claimed that Israel and all humanity had lost its way that our self-centeredness drives us to create false homes based on status and power, and these inevitably exclude others. We live in an exile of our own making. But Jesus said the true way home is one of weakness, of service, and of forgiveness. And then Jesus went into exile alongside us to show us the true way home. Which is? Well, Jesus said he is the way. His life and self-giving love proved more powerful than humanity's failure. He opened up a pathway to our real home. And as Jesus' followers committed themselves to him, they discovered this new way of being human. They believed that the real return from exile had begun. And so they would call themselves sojourners or wanderers. Oh, right. They would say things like, the world isn't our home and we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. So we're just uh, answering this question around, uh, uh, you know, tithing out of Malachi and how we can be so linear in reading of the Bible. And it's true. I mean, still my default when someone mentions the book of Malachi, it has to do with tithing. You know, and robbing God, but but you know what? It's so much more than that. And whenever we look at the text, we've always got to ask who's talking, to whom are they talking, why are they saying what they're saying, 
and how does this apply to me today? You know, and so that's how we've got to draw out timeless truths that apply to us, you know. Giving must not be an issue of getting. That's if I heard Sulu correctly. Yeah, absolutely. We don't preach prosperity doctrine in the sense that, hey, I give a tithe, I'm going to get a tithe back from God. <laughs> totally. It's, you know, we are we sacrificial in our giving because that allows us to, to participate in the grace of giving, which is a privilege. It's not a right. You know, um, so. Amen. Last session, gang. Let's talk about the intertestamental period. All right. Um, like I said, I did a 12-week course on this. And so, again, it was deciding what not to share with you guys today. Uh, because there's no, there's no way you can do justice to this period and the various currents that ultimately shaped the life of Jesus and the early Jesus movement in half an hour. Okay, um, so I'm just going to try and hit the main things for you guys and give you some further things to think about or even read about. Okay, so there's a common misconception that at the close of Malachi, we entered 400 years of silence emerging in the New Testament with John the Baptist. Okay, have you heard that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was no prophetic ministry. God didn't speak any further. Okay. These were nothing but silent years, okay? Much happened socio-politically, culturally, and even religiously. And here's a key thought. Jesus and the early church were products of this period and not Old Testament Judaism. Okay, we're talking of a period here of anywhere between four and 600 years. And so scholars refer to this period as the second temple period and dated roughly from the time that Herod the Great reconstructed the temple to its destruction in 70 AD. Okay, that, that date's actually wrong. 516 is, is the Rubable's temple. Herod the Great re did his reconstruction quite a bit after that period of time here. But the key thought is this. Jesus and the early church were products of the second temple period, not Old Testament Judaism. Knowing what happened in this period helps us better understand the New Testament. Okay? We go from the Old Testament, book of Malachi, and we open the New Testament and are confronted with a number of things that are distinctly Second Temple period. Politically, Israel is occupied still and ruled by Rome. Where did Rome come from? Okay? Cultural and social, all of a sudden there's these Greek and Hellenistic influences. When it comes to religious application of spiritual life all of a sudden we've got synagogues we've got different sects and we've got this proliferation of texts and focuses on texts it's a different world to the closing book of malachi <laughs> just say that okay so understanding the intertestamental period more accurately second temple period is critical to appreciating the new testament guys and that's why i i love this period okay so Talking about Second Temple period, or the intertestamental period, if we talk about the politics of what was going on at the time, we've talked a lot about per what happened under Persian rule, biblically Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, okay? But then after that, Malachi still prophesied in the time of the Persian Empire. This dude comes along, Alexander the Great, okay, and reshapes the world um, into very much of a Greek way of thinking. Now, what is Hellenism? It's a devotion to or imitation of ancient Greek thought, customs, or styles. And Alexander the Great, who lived from 356 to 323 BC, sought to Hellenize the whole known world. Okay? And so the first major current that influenced this period of time was a socio-political one. That was the size of Alexander the Great's empire in 323 BC. It's a massive area, okay? And so you can, so, and the, and the Jews were heavily influenced by this, as well as a number of different nations around them, okay? And the Greek became a common language. It became a common way of life. 
it was uh, colonialism, for want of a better word, on steroids. <laughs> okay, that's what it was. Um, so what happened under um, Greek rule, and again, you know, this is after the Persian Empire, is uh, Alexander the Great died suddenly, I think at the age of 26 or 27, okay? And his generals then fought over his land, his wealth, and all sorts of stuff. And two empires came to the fore, Ptolemaic, under Ptolemy, or, and the Seleucid empires, okay? These were two generals. And these two rose to prominence over this period of time. Um, so here's a second major current. Now this is socio-cultural. With this massive Greek influence that came upon the ancient Middle East, came changes in diet. Remember the Jews had their kosher laws, dress, sports, you know, often athletes competed naked. I mean, the, this was a conflict of worlds between Judaism and Hellenism. Some people gave into it and they gave and they, they became part Jew, part Greek. Uh, they decided they could eat what they want, and dress how they like, you know, and kind of um, became subservient to the culture and gave up their Jewish heritage, which is something that Herod the Great did, and we'll talk a little bit about him. But first major current that influenced this period of time was a socio-political one. Secondly, was a socio-cultural one with this massive Greek influence. Okay, and so what happened was, so you've seen Alexander the Great's rise to power, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, is Jewish independence. The Jews rose up and said, you know what, we're done with this. And this was the match that, that lit the, the, the proverbial fire, so to speak, Josephus writes in his uh, War of the Jews, he says, But being overcome with his violent passions and remembering what he had suffered during the siege, he compelled the Jews to dissolve the laws of their country and to keep their infants uncircumcised and to sacrifice swines, that's pig's flesh, upon the altar against which they all opposed themselves and the most approved among them were put to death. This guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, was, was one of these Greek rulers who came on in. And he, when he did this, this sparked a Jewish revolution. And it's called the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, basically, in the rural countryside, a, a guy by the name of Matthias resisted at a place called Modin. Uh, he and his sons then fle fled to the wilderness. Whenever I think about this, have any of you seen Braveheart, the movie Braveheart? Uh, Mel Gibson, okay, it's an old movie, but, you know, it's this idea of this rebel band in some distant little village that rides up, this one family, and it sparks this massive revolution. And so Mattathias' son, Judah, who is also called the Hammer, has a series of successful battles, and he wins. And him and his brother Jonathan and Simon succeed Judah, and this is during a period of time where the Seleucids, remember you had the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, uh, were weak, and so they grew strong through the diplomacy. Both brothers are eventually murdered, okay? But then what starts is the Hasmonean dynasty, okay? This leads down to Herod the Great. Herod was a part of this Hasmonean dynasty. And Herod decided to embark on some massive building projects which included the reconstruction of the temple. It took 46 years. Now, this is the same temple that Jesus now talks about in the New Testament. We 46 years to build and required over 18,000 workers. The temple itself was 45 meters high, and the materials used were local limestone, limestone gold, and marble. Remember, Jesus was taken to task for saying, listen, overthrow this temple and I'll resurrect it in three days. Okay? They were thinking literally, he was talking metaphorically about his own body because they knew how much construction effort had gone into building this temple. So, what I've got here 
are some pics that I took of me at the temple that I wanted to show you guys. Um, so let's hope this video plays nicely. Okay, so that's just the Temple Mount, guys. This is all that remains of Herod's Temple when it was sacked by the Romans in AD 70, okay? It's just the platform on which the Temple was built. So you're looking at the foundations of the Temple that I just showed you in that video, okay? And you stand next to this, you arch your neck back like that to see the top of it. It is massive. It's like, you know, the size of the Temple Mount is two rugby fields put together. Okay. Massive, absolutely massive, okay? And so these are pictures uh, that I have of, of that area. Um, there's Douglas just showing you what the temple would have looked like uh, in his, uh, you know, uh, in its time before it was uh, ransacked. And remember I talked, okay, so there's a picture of me showing, you know, the southwestern wall. And this is me sitting on the stairs leading up to the Temple Mount, okay? So I, I thought I'd loaded it, but I didn't. Surrounding the Temple Mount are these miniature baptistries, okay? And you would go down to be ceremonially cleansed, and you'd walk up these stairs. But some stairs are a good two meters apart. Some are smaller, some are two meters apart. And the best guess is for traffic control with the amount of people going up to the Temple Mount. But it was very easy to dry from the time you got out of the baptistry to the top. Also, what's very interesting for me is that often people have asked, well, how could 3,000 people be baptized on the day of Pentecost? When you visit the Temple Mount and you see the amount of mikvot around, you, it's totally possible to see how 3,000 people were baptized in one day mm -hmm. because of the amount of the baptistries there. You know? So just a little bit of real life, tangible, this place exists. It's not just some writing in, in the Bible. It's very real. I've walked it. I've been there. You know. So, so third major current. Remember, we've talked about socio-political, socio-cultural, and now we're talking about religious. When this was probably the biggest flashpoint in this period of time. Syncretism versus monotheism. Syncretism is just basically a way of, man, we worship everyone, everything. And the Greeks would conquer nations and incorporate those nations of gods into their pantheon of gods. And the Romans did the exact same way. Okay? And what put them in major conflict with Judaism was that the Jews said, there's one God. Here are Israel, the Lord our God is one. And so they, they really battled with this idea. And so after Malachi... The prophetic ministry gave way to more of a priestly and scribal authority. So the priests gained more preeminence and the scribes gained more preeminence. Because there was less and less prophecy, people relied more and more on what the prophets had said, written down in text. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you saw more of a devotion rise to the texts and the proliferation of many more writings which I'll talk about in a second, okay? We saw the development of the synagogue. All the synagogue was, was a meeting place outside of the temple. But the Jews in the diaspora, those in Babylon, where did they go for church? They had to create a place to meet. And so when the exiles returned to Jerusalem, this idea of meeting in the synagogue became real. No longer the focus was the main temple, but you could have synagogue as well. And you had the development of various sects as well. Here's just a number of sects that existed in the time leading up to Jesus, okay? In the mainstream, you had the Sanhedrin. They were in charge of the Jewish populace. Chief priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, elders, the Chavarim, and the sages. They all kind of sat mainstream. Then left of center, you had the Herodians, Hellenists, and Gnostics. Right of center, you had the Zealots, Samaritans, Essenes. And here's my point. 
there wasn't one form of Judaism being practiced. We, we, we like to refer to them as Judaisms. Okay? Because there, there were varying forms of Judaisms being practiced at the time. This is the world of Jesus that I just described. When you enter the pages of the New Testament, this is what we are confronted with. Pharisees, Sadducees, synagogues, and this political things going on. And so that's why understanding context and history as a backdrop helps you to appreciate what was going on in the New Testament. Um, a closing thought. These are works written in the intertestamental or second temple period that weren't included in the Bible that we know today, okay? But what's interesting is a lot of works here are referenced in here, okay? Um, there are one or two books in this where scholars, scholars have serious question marks around, okay? Like, how on earth did that book make it into the canon? Because once you read some of this works, it reads exactly like that. Okay, so I'm dropping a pebble in the ocean to say, read the Apocrypha. Okay, I know we've got to focus on reading this, but understanding what this is all about helps answer the question to your friends that say, well, what about the other books that aren't included in the Bible? How do you respond to that? If you don't know what those other books are and why they weren't included in the canon, you're going to have some challenges. Yeah. Okay. So, when we talk about canonicity and apologetics, we can get into this. But if you want to see what the Apocrypha looks like, there it is. Okay, so. Amen. The Intertestamental Period. Done and done, people.